Uh, so at this point, you may or may not know, I am Tim Soder, one third of your professors, but also collectively all of your professors. <laughs> Um, my talk today is going to be exploring your own influences. Um, right off the top of the bat, some, some of these pieces of photographers and artists I show are on my page, on the FIT page um, that goes along with this class, uh, and some are not. So definitely take some notes if something that you your a certain way, like, yeah, that's good, write it down. Also, one light trigger warning for the work of Joel Peter Whitkin. Anybody know Joel Peter Whitkin's work? That would blow my mind. Oh, yes. How did you find out about Joel Peter Wicked? Um, I'm not like, I'm into that I'm very Uh huh. And he made Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, nice. So, Joel Peter Wicked's work, um, he uses cadavers in, in his work. And I don't see it as being really explicit, but that's the thing with the trigger ones. Who knows? Maybe you will. I don't think it's that crazy. Just let me know it's at the beginning of the presentation. I'll say this is Joel Peter Wicked. You can go wherever you want in your mind. Or whatever. <laughs> okay, so exploring your own influences. Here are things I want you to think about while I am talking. Your influences that shape you don't have to be about photography. I'm going to show you a lot of examples of things that turn me on and make me who I am as a photographer and artist that really don't have much to do with photography. Uh, connect with who you are and put that in your photography in your heart. Figure out who you are and put the personal stuff in the work. That's always the best stuff. That's the stuff everybody wants to see in there. Uh, tell uh, the story your way and make it as personal as possible. Kind of what I just said. Connect with your heroes and influences. You'll see that I've done that in my work, and also that's what my work actually is in a lot of cases. Um, also, don't be afraid to get messy and go somewhere uncomfortable. Somebody gave me uh, this advice knowing that that is tough for me to take. I am a photographer. We're all control freaks. We like things like nice and tidy and orderly. Um, he was like, yeah, let it go where it's going to go. If it's a mistake, it's a mistake. And that's really good advice. Um, in our current era, saturated with photographs, seen every second on Instagram, the internet, peer to peer digital photography, all that stuff. How do you make a photograph special? That's another thing I spend a lot of time thinking and trying to solve. Currently, I'm trying to solve that by making photography books. That's why I'm trying to figure that out. But I think that is your photography generations um, cross the bear and the problem to solve, which is kind of a good one. I mean, maybe that's what photography should have been all the time. How do you make it you know, unique? So, when I was four years old, that's right, you will not see another lecture when somebody starts off when they were four. Um, there was a guy who lived in my parents' building, where they lived, in an apartment, and he came to me and said, hey, uh, I'm moving. Do you think Timmy would like this big box of comic books? I was four. Luckily, my mother was like, yeah. Here are those same comic books. I have the exact same giant box of comic books, almost every one, in my possession today. And they were from an era that was like a little bit before me, so that was even better. So I got to learn a lot of things. Mad Magazine, uh, Max and I were looking up that, turned me on to some things. Um, it really kind of opened up my brain. Those stories, the color palette, um, the dynamic action in them. Covers like these, when I got, and I, and I obviously I could read it for. So um, I just had them for years, and every now and then it was a rainy day, I would get bored, and I would just pick one out, I would read it. I reread them over and over and over for a period of a decade or more. Um, but these covers, to me, were really heavy and kind of crazy. Like, this is amazing. This was an early technique using photography and merging it with that uh, comic illustration. Um, this one terrified me as a kid. I'm still not sure what's going on there, but uh, it freaked me out. <laughs> also, Adventure Comics, that Adventure logo is so great. I love um, typography as well. So I'm reading these as a kid, um, and then even as an adult, I would go on to find some of the original art that was from that era. This is a piece that I own. It was a preliminary sketch for that page on the right. Um, another influence I had growing up beyond comic books was the arts that came along with music. Um, one record label in 
particular was factory records. Um, New Order was on factory records and a bunch of other bands. New Order was kind of the biggest um, band on there. But Peter Sandel was the art director, and he had an amazing vision to me. Yeah, I think you can see the, the link to the comic book colors that I really enjoyed, but now it's photography. So these are actually Polaroids with gel lights on them. It's another example of two different album covers. Again, with that same crazy palette, this uh, chair is just a model that somebody used some gel lights on and took that picture and became this in that era, which is like 1990 or 89. Um, that became kind of an iconic cover. Here more things in my, now I say my collection. They were my CDs. Um, I saw this a few years ago at PS1, the book fair that we mentioned that happens uh, out of Queens. Um, here are two New Order posters. I had that one at the top um, pinned on my wall when I was in college. They are trying to charge $400 for that now. I think I paid about $15. So maybe your, your wall art is going to be worth a lot if you can keep it in decent condition for 20, 20 years. Um, so when I was at school, the way that we accessed uh, photography pre-internet, obviously there was no internet, um, was the library, books. I really, really became connected to books because in books, you would see photos that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Often those photos were only reprinted in those books. You could either see them in a book, you could see them in a slideshow that your photo professor showed you, or you could see it maybe in a gallery show if you're close enough to get to New York, and then you could see the show on the wall, and that was it. Um, there wasn't any way to really kind of hold on to it beyond these things. So these were three books that um, myself and the other, I don't know, really out there photo students were always fighting over. You know, <laughs> if I said, oh, who has the great Michael's book? My buddy would be like, oh, Nadi has it checked out. Like, we actually knew who kept those in rotation. We were always fighting over these books. So one of the books that really influenced me was the work of Dwayne Martins. So it's a uh, photograph that says, this photograph is my proof. This photograph is my proof. There was that afternoon when, when things were so good between us, and she embraced me. And we were so happy. It did happen. She loves me. She, she did love me. Look for yourself. Look see for yourself. So he's a photographer who's using text with the photograph, which was he was kind of one of the earlier people to do that, try that, show it. But also he's saying um, how utilitarian photographs are, um, that we use them for things. It's not just pretty on the wall. They actually help us remember things and also, in this case, prove that your memory isn't tricking you. you know, photographs live, we'll get into that at another, another class, but at least that's what he's doing here. So even when he was shooting um, what I thought were kind of interesting portraits, he would still write underneath them in his uh, particular um, handwriting. He would do these sequences. Um, Paradise Regained is the story of Adam and Eve as they go from kind of an office setting back to Adam and Eve. And he would do things back then that I thought were really interesting, like in-camera double exposures that, that were kind of Cool to me. Okay, Joel Peter Wicked, only about five or six inches. Uh, Joel Peter Wicked, another person uh, we were all kind of influenced by. Um, he would set up these kind of wild tableaus and print them in the dark room and then lay tissue paper and different things over the print while he was printing. And then put like powdered graphite, which would make these little dots on top of the um, printing paper or the vellum. If the vellum was raised a little here or sunk a little there, Maybe one portion of the print that he was making would be a little in focus or a little out of focus. So those techniques combined with this imagery to me was like, wow, I really want to do that. I started scratching on my negatives and doing things like that in order to kind of imitate, imitate them and kind of work through the process. This is a good time to imitate people, by the way. If you want to figure it out, just do it and try, try and recreate it. Nobody cares, that's why you're recruited at school. It's not like you're doing it for a job or something to be like, oh, that looks like so and so's work. Work it out here. Originality, get the rest of your life. This guy, by the way, I saw him. He used to perform at Coney Island. Uh, I saw him maybe in the late 90s. He was still going. Uh, so we're beyond Joe Perwickton. Now we're onto the Starn Twins. The Starn Twins have also figured out a way to make photography unique. 
like those other two cards. They were making these unique prints that they would um, frame kind of specifically. Uh, that one flower looks like it was done almost in a style of test strips and things like that. Um, they would cut up things, they would scotch tape things together and make these kind of patterns, and I thought that was great. I hadn't really thought about how do you make something unique like that. Like, it's a photograph, you can make a thousand of them. They were trying to show away that it's, it's unique like painting, perhaps. Another person I learned about when I was in school is this photographer, Arthur Tress. Um, Brad mentioned him last class. Um, and I really liked his stuff because he was doing these unusual things, like uh, Brad had mentioned the dream player, where he said uh, Tress went out and had people enact the dreams that they had had and he would photograph. And that picture of the boy on the right is uh, one of the dream collector photos. These are actually examples of direction. Um, there are no rebounds at school. <laughs> so, I get out of school, I move to a big city, I'm super green and naive, I grew up in like middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, I get to the city. And the first job I get is at the store um, down in Soho uh, called a photographer's place. It was a store that sold just photography books. At that point, it was the only store like that in New York and possibly the United States. What was great is I didn't know much about photography books, and this guy, Harvey Zucker, um, gave me a really great lesson about photography books um, while also paying me $250 a week before taxes. <laughs> so everybody got what they wanted. Um, these were some of the books that um, I was learning about from Frank. Uh, Nancy Burson down there is the black square cover. Um, Nancy Burson's an interesting photographer. She um, shot these all with a plastic camera. I think going back to making photography unique, she used a plastic camera um, called a Diana, or, or there's another plastic camera called a Holga. This might be a Holga because they're square. Um, and she was um, photographing these people respectfully, or you could argue that, uh, that had cranial. Um, uh, kind of distorted faces. She was documenting them with this, this camera that itself also has weird imperfections because it's a strange plastic lens that kind of does what it wants. Each Holga, at least back in the day, was kind of unique in, it, in the way that it was so cheaply made that none, no two would kind of really look the same. Is that wrong? I don't think I've seen that. Here's one that Nancy did where she was um, aging uh, it's the subject um, using Mega, and she later went on to sell technology that she had co-invented with her husband um, to the FBI, where she used this very early digital technology to show um, what someone who was abducted, kidnapped, etc., might look like now, five or six years later, so they could try and still rescue this kid. This is, old, this is a long time ago, probably the early 80s. This is a composite of um, about eight different faces. Uh, recently, she did a, a Trump Putin composite for time where she merged those two faces. So that was very fascinating. Uh, the other thing it taught me was um, the value of photo books and what, what out of print means. So these two books at the time, uh, and actually still are, were out of print. That means nobody's printed them since the first time they were printed, and that means they're possibly scarce. Bruce Davidson book I found on the street for like $10, and I knew from working at the store it was worth $100. Same thing with Passage by Irving Penn. I got that for $5 and they'd set out um, a blanket with some things they were selling. I knew from working at the bookstore Oh, that's a rare book, and that's another hundred dollars. So, Bruce Davidson got really turned on to him because I liked how he embedded himself with his subjects. This was a gang uh, called the Brooklyn Jokers, and he would pal around with them, and to me, get these really close, intimate photos, and I thought, oh, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to get in there and be with those people and not be shooting from the outside or kind of timidly shooting something. I would be a part of it and shooting. 
Dennis and Bruce Davidson. So here in New York, the first person I met, or one of the first few people, was Delmar. I thought it was going to be the only photographer because Delmar was a DJ. He came over to my house one day, we rated all my CDs, and I was like, oh my god, you know everything I'm talking about, all these kind of esoteric electronic bands and things that I love. Delmar also knew that too, and I couldn't have that conversation back in my way. So Delmar was DJing all the time. I, I started hanging out with Delmar and going to different venues and things like that. And I started documenting these odd parties uh, in the mid-90s um, in New York. Uh, this guy Aaron would make um, these sculptures for the parties. Here's Delmar again. This is a party in the East Village that lasted 36 hours. These people lived there. They had one living room and then one kind of kitchen and a bedroom in the back. And they would open up their ground floor apartment for 36 hours, they would put the list of every DJ that was going to play for 36 hours on the door. And I'd be like, oh, Delmar's playing at 4. So I'd go home and I'd sing at 4, like 3.50 a.m. I'd wake up and I'd like go back to the party and it just kept going. It was free. If you were walking past, you were a neighbor, you could just go in. It's a really interesting time.
are photo comic books, comic books that are made up with photographs or vice versa. Fumetti, if you go to Italy, Fumetti is just really the Italian comic. Fumetti, the word, means little pops of smoke, which is a reference to um, the word balloons that are in comics. So here are other examples from other countries. This one might be from Greece. Um, here was one, this magazine, uh, late night, it's called Popschmeer, where they did the, the Charles Manson story in the style of, of Fumetti. So I thought, oh, well, I, I kind of want to do something like that. So I was thinking about the comics that I was really into, Tomb of Dracula, and this guy Blade that I was kind of into for a while. So I asked two of my friends, Jack and Gabe, I'm like, who wants to be Dracula and who wants to be Blade? And they're like, yeah, we got this. So this was in Greenpoint, I don't know, 15 plus years ago, back when nobody cared. Um, and we just went there one night and goofed off. I bought a pretty good Dracula cape. They totally got into it. Drugs weren't even involved. <laughs> um, they nailed it, I thought. I bought some smoke in a can, which I had never used before. I think uh, that is a good thing to invest in just for a fun night out. <laughs> um, and here were some that actually printed on the uh, actual paper that you would use. It's like 11 by, I don't know what the dimensions are, but it's like this. And that's the, the paper, the standard paper that comic illustrators would use. And I was printing on that, trying to emulate that, that look. Here was a nice one on the right that was a happy accident when I had run too low on ink. Hmm. And it made this kind of wonderful one-off thing. Again, going back to like making something unique, sometimes unique is an accident, but recognizing the unique thing is kind of great. You know, like that's part of it. So it showed all the things I would have never seen in that standard negative, like the buildings just a little bit, the background, and some other elements. So, um, some time passes, and for some reason, Dwayne Michaels' work uh, pops back into my head. I'm still thinking about him. I don't know why. I just come back to the fact that like his work is so accessible, it's interesting. Um, double exposures, I think, are cool, especially in camera. You know, you, you take one shot, you do not advance the film. You take the other shot and you're trying to really remember where the first shot was and hope that everything lines up. This is about as good as it gets. Like, the lighter bowler hat is just perfectly skimming the top of that other one. I mean, that's skill and some luck, you know, like a good balance. Here's another solution I liked <coughs> with Johnny Cash, <coughs> where he blocked the reflection in order to show Johnny Cash in a hotel room. I like the guy walking away. But I like this photography, I thought it's interesting. There's, there's like a story there, even if it's one single photo. You know, there's some intrigue to that, and I want to know what the story is. Um, here's something. There are things here uh, not seen in this photograph. My shirt was wet with perspiration. The beer tasted good, but I was still thirsty. On and on and on. Another way of showing, like, uh, photographs can only do so much, and that's why his thing was like the right on them, because they can only show you so much. They can't show you that the beer tasted good, necessarily. They can't show you that my shirt was wet if I'm shooting from this angle, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> he also did it on these sequences, which is maybe what he's best known for. Um, it had a solo show back in 1973, I think, at the Museum of Modern Art. What I like about it is, I look like this photo. <laughs> um, what I like about it is, um, it's a story. It's a whole story with just those what is it, seven photographs. And it's done very simply. You can do this tomorrow. It's just a double exposure, or you could obviously cheat to it and do some super present. Um, but that simple idea really has some weight to it, you know, in a technique. You didn't need like 12 flashes or something like that. This is called a chance meeting. 
uh, which back then was uh, uh, an allegory to uh, the gay encounter. So I think, okay, I know Dwayne lives in the city, I'm gonna figure out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna contact him. So um, I'd seen a documentary on him, and uh, it was very short, it was on YouTube, it said, one, it said East 19th Street, they had a close up of his buzzer on his door, it just said East 19th Street. So one day I was walking down East 19th Street, and I decided to look at every buzzer on every door. And I was like scanning the, both streets, like did the whole thing. By the end of the thing, I'm like, this is, I'm not gonna find it. Sometimes I go up and I'd be like, that's it. At the end, I did. I went up and I'm like, oh my God, it's that one. Well, which I ran away. <laughs> now I have the address. I have his address. I'm like, yeah, I live there. I decided to write him a letter. I wrote him this letter. I'm not gonna read it, it's just embarrassing as hell. <laughs> but the letter basically was like, hey, I like your work. I want to come see you. Um, I carried this little card around in my wallet that I had laminated that I think is good advice for life. It says, do it. You have only two choices in life doing the bullshit. I hate photographers who talk about photographs but never take any, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he wrote back, <clears throat> and I ended up making a book out of our correspondence and me meeting him and um, getting to know him a little better, things like that. Um, I never told him I was making this book. Uh, when it was done, I showed it to him and I was like, oh my God, I hope he's like, oh, this is terrible or take these five images out or something. Um, he just said, oh, this looks like it took a very long time. And that was it, and I was like, great. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I wanted to make a book that was about him, but really it's a book about me. So it also gave me the freedom to do things like this, where I took a picture of that buzzer that I mentioned, but then I kind of blackened out all the other people on the buzzers, and I drew this kind of white smoke balloon uh, where I could place text. I also included like, Postcards I had sent him and things like that to kind of help tell this narrative story. I like the way that he tells narrative stories. I want to contribute and do something like that on um, my own time. And thinking about like, oh, somebody who you think is your hero, um, I was like, how do I kind of show that like this is important to me or show like you're really fetishizing something or really super interested in something? I loved his handwriting so much, so I got this macro lens, um, and I photographed just little bits of his handwriting. That's the DU from Dwayne. And you can see in the U where like, he scratched it with a quill, but the ink didn't release because of the, um, you can see it because of this, this macro lens. That's also what it looked like you know, at least eight years ago. I have a lot more hair now. <laughs> Um, and then in the end, the end to this book was, I needed an ending, was, uh, well, what would Dwayne's advice give to me if I, if I had to figure that out? Because I didn't really know him that well, I was just kind of doing this thing. And I think he'd say this, now it's time for you to kill the Buddha. That expression means, you've got your hero, we all have heroes, or people we think are great. At some point, you have to kill that metaphorically. Not because it's being recorded. Um, <laughs> Because you have to move on. Like, they can be your heroes, but if they're your heroes forever, in some sense, they're the ceiling. You, you're not going to go beyond that. And at some point, it's like they've had their time. It's now your time. You've got to go on and do it. Uh, he also kind of has the same sense of humor that I like. So, um, around the same time, I was at the book fair that everybody keeps mentioning. We're just building up all this hype, and hopefully next year it's back. Because it is truly fantastic. Um, but I'm walking past this table, and I see a book on the table. And I'm looking at the book upside down. And the book says, uh, Arthur Tress, like, skateboarders. Um, okay, that seems odd, but there's a young woman working at the table. And I said, uh, I said hey, I said, is, this, is this the Arthur Tress? I said, how old is he? And she just goes like this. Oh my god, I look over and there's this guy. I'm like, oh, I said, are you Arthur? And he goes, oh yeah. I'm like, oh. I said, I didn't mean to be rude. 
I said, this just doesn't look like the work you know, that I think of when I think of your work. And he's like, oh, do you know my work? I said, yeah, you're like part of the history of photography. So this is a picture of how kind of that moment. Um, so we got to talking a little bit. He's like, oh, I'm visiting from California, but I'm here for like the next few days. He's like, do you want to go out shooting? Would you guys come out and shoot out there? I said, oh, that'd be great. So that was the next book that I made. Um, it was about Arthur. This book's a little different because I've actually had like a closer relationship to him. The other thing was like the wings over here, I'm kind of a little bit. Arthur, like, we became friends and it was a kind of a different situation. I just knew him better. That is actually um, coming out. <clears throat> but in getting back to making things unique and trying things out, um, I went back to that idea of like, oh, I can just paint on photographs. You know, I can do things to make it unique. How am I going to make it unique? This, uh, which I recommended to you last class, is a 11 by 17 Staples color laser printer. I think it cost like a dollar or something. Um, of the photo, I painted on that, I re-photographed it. That's the picture that's in the book. The color here looks terrible, it looks way better on my monitor. But the point is, like, that was good enough and it looks great. I'm trying to push these inexpensive uh, materials because I know your students and nobody has money. The other thing I liked doing was uh, collage. I started doing collage. I was getting frustrated with this book, and Arthur was giving me some ideas and trying to get me to loosen up. He was the person who said, um, let things get messy, like don't, don't get so tight. So I started taking um, other you know, photos that I'd taken of him, putting it in the 11 by 17 thing, cutting them out, and doing more collage. For the text, there was an interview and then I would just take a random email, not random, I selected emails that he had sent me. And this is actually one of them. Hi, I just had some dental surgery, so my mouth is sore, so I will call you now. Still don't know what that means. Um, he is a funny person. Uh, when he calls me and leaves a voicemail, he, this is, uh, I should play it, it's on my phone. It starts off like this. Oh, oh hi, Tim. This is off the tress. And then he goes on and on. It's like, yeah, I know who you are. I made a book about you. Like, yeah, <laughs> and then at the very end, he'll go, oh, okay, thanks. Oh. And he like signs it, like with his say his name is great. <laughs> um, so yeah, this book was fun to do because I tried getting looser. You know, like using these layouts was fun. Here's a little bit of uh, the interview that I did talking about his connection, I think, to the water and the ocean. He goes swimming a lot to try and stay somewhat fit. Uh, example of his handwriting, you scan that in to, to work with the photos. Um, <laughs> then I started doing things just for fun. I took this one photo in a bunch of inexpensive staples. I don't get paid by staples. Inexpensive staple prints. And wanted to keep going because I wasn't done. I started doing more collage and painting on them. And just trying to do things that normally I'd be a little more uptight about. Um, and that became a, a limited edition of the book. I got 500 books made, and I set aside 32 of them. Random number, this one day he was visiting, and I said, oh, Arthur, will you sign some of these? And he said, sure. And he ended up signing 32 of them. Oh my god, that's, that's great. It's a weird number. So, in every one of these limited books, I am painting and drawing um, on the image. I mean, I am a little bit of a frustrated drawer. I love, or I used to love drawing as a kid, and I kind of got away from it. Um, I would love to draw kind of comic book things. I had such appreciation for that, but I love photography more. So this is a way to bring in a lot of different elements in our photography. They're excruciating to do because I'm really self-conscious and I'm tight. So I'll start and I'll draw a little bit of something and then I'll just do, and I'll pace around the room for like 45 minutes. I'll go back and I'll try to like <laughs> fix something or make it different and I'll just, it just goes on forever. All right, here's the front and the back of that book. Uh, this year, uh, I discovered the work of uh, Lorna Simpson. I mean, I knew Lorna Simpson's work. I didn't know her collage work. And I saw this book, which I think 
actually came out this year. And I think you can see the link to the stuff that I enjoy doing. Um, I thought these looked absolutely gorgeous. They're so like simple on the page, but the brush strokes are really amazing. Like the brush strokes between the left and right are so wildly different because they're kind of opposite of watercolor, and there's sharper ones. She used uh, cutouts from old um, Ebony and Jet magazines, African American magazines, um, probably from like the 70s, 60s. But also, these were really incredibly creative using these um, different uh, rock uh, structures like garnets um, as the hair. And it goes deeper into the importance of African Americans and hair. Um, but there's a lot of levels to it. But even if you just went by the visual, the first layer, to me, it's really exciting. Um, I got a bunch of books. <coughs> excuse me. I got a bunch of books off of um, Amazon. Another company I don't really want to promote. But if something like this comes out, I'll go on Amazon and see if there's like a beat up used one that's like really inexpensive. And very often there is, and I'll get that one. I used to be more precious and tight about my books. Um, but now I just want a copy of it that's inexpensive because that, that leaves me more money to buy more books. And I just want the thing to look at it. That's my tip for book buying. So um, currently there's a project that I'm working on which is yet again about influences and things that have influenced me. This is a, a detail of a wall in my apartment. So there's a Jeff Mermelstein photo down there of um, the skids at a bucket stop. If you squint, you can see the monkey in the lower left hand corner. Here's a picture I took of Dennis Hopper on the street one day. Uh, the design of uh, some key parents uh, that I had um, when I met them at a car or a somewhere. It's a pullback shot. So I was thinking, like, okay, I want to, I, I am my stuff to some degree because I've curated so much of my life in things, in books, in artwork, in ephemera. How do I use that to show people, like, I'm really this? What am I going to do? What's the solution for that? So I thought about this idea when I was um, when I back way back when when I had just moved to New York. I would go to the Strand. How many people have been to the Strand bookstore? Thank God, Strand's amazing. It's <laughs> still like holding it down. It's a little slimmer after the pandemic, but uh, it's still there. Uh, just below 14th Street, and like 12th and Broadway, at Strand's a giant bookstore. Um, <clears throat> I used to go there when I was just out of college, and I would buy these um, auction house catalogs because it was an inexpensive way to buy photo books. Hmm. So this Christie's catalog, this was um, the collection of Robert Mitchell book. It was like everything he had when he was gone when he died, and his estate is auctioning off to get the money. Here are some of the items that he had. It's kind of surprising that, you know, he didn't really have a large photography collection there. He collected other things. And by looking at these things, you can get perhaps a more well-rounded idea of who Robert Mapplethorpe was, rather than just looking at his photographs. Um, here is a more contemporary auction house catalog. They're still pretty cheap. You can still get them at the Strand. Um, and the photography has come a long way. They used to mostly be black and white with occasional color photographs in there, drab gray, you know, photographed a certain way. Now they can be a lot of different things. They can have this nice still life quality. Um, this collection is amazing because they're all kind of spotlit. Beautifully shot. The paper was a nice choice. It was a, an uncoated paper that was quite nice with no gloss. Uh, here are two more. This is uh, somebody who collected, I think, every photo in Robert Frank's uh, The Americans, one of maybe the best photo book ever made, arguably. Um, and then one of the right I recently got, which made me really excited, is a bass player from New Order was auctioning off his stuff, like old guitarist DVDs or fan items that he was sent. Um, or some of those albums that I really liked I showed you earlier on where the entire band had signed it way back then. So I love the idea of these catalogs being their own kind of photo book. Here are some of the Peter Hook uh, 
uh, things that he was selling. I really considered buying that melodica down here. <laughs> Because you can do things like that when you're not married and don't have kids. <laughs> um, so I started on this project. I did this, I, I documented, just started documenting a lot of things that I own, thinking about what I was going to write to go along with them. And then I started laying it out as if it were a catalog. And the idea of this is that it's posthumous, meaning that I've already died, the estate of Tim Soder is established. They're auctioning off all of my stuff. And how do I, how do I write about it? You know, like, how do I tell this story? Um, the way that I figured it out was, I said, okay, in these things over there, where it says art form, at the bottom art form is an art magazine, I'm gonna pretend that all the text has been pulled from past interviews with me. So I can say what I want, and then I'll say, oh yes, that, that was in you know, storytelling before photography, an article where I was interviewed back in December 2008. So all of these, I like making books because it's still photography, but it's making me figure out all of these little um, solutions along the way in making the book. Um, so I, I gave everything like a true estimated value of how much money I thought it would cost. Um, I talked about what, why this was the Warhol collection up in the upper left, and talked about why that influenced me when I was you know, a high school student, how much I liked Andy Warhol. Um, same with this, it's a little interesting story of my, my first trip to New York, and I found this signed book by one of the members of Andy Warhol's factory. I was so excited to get it. Uh, same with this guy, Gerard Malanga. He actually did most of the paintings for Andy. He was the guy who pulled the silk screen while Andy went to Los Angeles. Like this guy was this guy. So I met him at like a little poetry reading in Pennsylvania where he came close enough to my reach when I was a high school student. And long story short, I talked to him at the end. I said, oh, I'm doing the Xerox art. I figured out I'm, I'm doing the Xerox art where I take things, uh, I drag them quickly while the Xerox thing is going across, and then they become distorted because I'm going quicker than the thing moving. And he said, Oh yeah, we used to do that at the factory. Like we used to do a lot of Xerox art, and I just looked at him. I was crushed because I thought like I had a new idea, never been done. You know, I couldn't believe it. And he was nice. He saw in my eyes that I was just like, because I, I couldn't hide it. I was just like, oh, every that was like every idea I had up until then was in this fine here. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, uh, we did Xerox art. You're doing Xerox art. He's like, they're never going to be the same. Whatever you're doing is going to be your thing. That's the way all art works. And he totally saved it because he could see I was crushed. He was very nice. So I wrote that whole story down in here. And then acted like it was um, a past uh, interview. And then <laughs> Another day I went into my obsession of buying navy blue t shirts. You know, I, I swear, every day I pretty much have a navy blue t shirt. But um, this was just kind of a funny thing. Instead of making it all like uptight, this talks about some like light OCD tendencies I have. I separate <laughs> my navy blue t-shirts into two piles in my door where ones are like a little faded and the other ones are like a truer blue. And then I started obsessively like marking the tags to figure out which ones were which and shit. It got way out of control. That's what that says. So I don't want it to be this uptight, stuffy book. I want it to be a book of good, interesting stories that really do say who I am. Okay, so the conclusion of this is Arthur came over and visited me one day back when I met him at the uh, book fair. And uh, I was showing him my photos. At that point, I loved making uh, six by four by six photos. I loved it. Shooting with a little point and shoot with the stylus. And I made these mini prints. They're my favorite whiteboards. Because to me, what do they look like? They look like comic book panels. You know, they're like these nice poppy colors. They all had the white border. I loved it. You could arrange them to make some sort of narrative story or something like that. Oh. So I edited all these photos that I'd taken, uh, taken for 10 years, and I edited it down to about 85 photos. 10 years of shooting, 85 photos. <clears throat> so Arthur's there, and um, he always has his Hasselblad camera there. And he's like, oh, you know what? You like your photos, and I know you like your comic books. 
you should do something like this. And he goes, he picks out a comic book, and he puts um, one of the four by six photos on the cover of the comic book. And uh, he's like, this is a good idea. You should, you should try it. And I, I was like, oh, okay. And then at the end of the day, I said goodbye to him. I came back, I'm like, that's a goddamn stupid idea. I'm never gonna do that idea. <laughs> so against that idea, it seems, it seems so stupid. I'm so angry at that idea. About a year later, I don't know why, I'm like, yeah, try that idea. So I tried that idea, and I made all these things, I think, in one day. And it was a great idea. Arthur's like full of good ideas, and I should have listened. Um, but I just started going and trying to make relationships with the photos in the cover. So that guy's eye in the lower right-hand corner and the eye of the uh, threading place. Mm. Sometimes they're a little on the funnier side, sometimes they're more of a visual connection. <laughs> that to me was really the, the line work was so similar. So I made this book, I called it Fumetti, um, even though kind of these aren't really Fumetti like sequence photo comic books, but it was photography and comic books. Fumetti made sense to me. And all of those comic books that I used for Fumetti uh, were the ones that guy gave me when I was four years old. So that's how much that influenced me. I literally used the materials that that guy gave me as a four-year-old to make this book that Arthur gave me as an idea. So, thank you. Um, your homework assignment is, as it always is, 350 words on this talk. I put some, uh, Question prompts in the week. When you go there, you can be like, oh, what should I write about? I'll give you a few uh, things to think about with this talk that make things easier. And we will see you next Wednesday for our very first guest speaker. Yes? Yeah? No, no, Jessica, you're next. That's right. Jessica's next week. We will see you then. Don't forget to sign your name before you leave in the back. <laughs>